To introduce our speakers in a moment, I'll invite club member Gerilyn Brousseau with Classification Human and Community Services to the podium. Many of you know how Gerilyn and her mother, Ray Cheney, established the International Non-Governmental Organization, or NGO, Peace Trees Vietnam, to remove unexploded mines and bombs, as well as to build schools in Vietnam. During the presentation today, you're encouraged to enter your, enter your questions for our speakers using the Zoom chat feature. And later, following the prepared remarks, our club Sergeant at Arms, Ken Grant, will moderate the question and answer session during that part of the program. And now to introduce our speakers is our very own Gerilyn Brousseau. Gerilyn, you're on mute. It unmuted and then muted back, Gerilyn. Okay. We're good. Thank you, President Jimmy. Fellow Rotarians and honored guests, in honor of International Women's Day, it's my great joy to introduce two visionary and extraordinary women, Win Nguyen and Tan Tan, co-founders of Vietz for Afghans. Win is a Vietnamese refugee who came to the US as an unaccompanied minor when she was 11 years old. She owns new restaurant on Capitol Hill and is a social entrepreneur right here in Seattle. Tan Ten is a seasoned journalist, an exceptional storyteller and documentarian who served Microsoft and currently Starbucks. She was born and raised in Olympia, Washington. Her parents are boat refugees from Vietnam. In August, when Nguyen saw the harrowing imagery of Afghan families amidst the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, it triggered memories of her family's tragic escape from Vietnam as boat people, losing the lives of her mother and her two brothers. She immediately called Tan and said, we must do something for the Afghan people. They literally sprang to action. Now let's listen, let's lean in and give Win and Tan a warm welcome and hear their stories from escaping Vietnam as refugees to warmly supporting and welcoming nine Afghan families from Vietnam right here to Seattle. Hi everyone, I um, would just like to wave to everybody. I don't see Wien's window. Wien, can you wave so I know that you're here as well? Um, yes, I'm here. Hi, okay, we definitely want to try to keep this, uh, a lot of you are probably a little zoomed out, we know that you're taking a lot of meetings and a lot of events like via this forum, so we really want to try to be conversational, we do have a little bit of a presentation to share today, but if you have questions, I would just encourage you to please put them in the chat. And as we go, um, we can try to answer those questions or maybe a little later after we finish our presentation, um, we can answer those questions as well. But um, on behalf of Vietz for Afghans, we just wanna thank you so much for having us here today. I just have to say as a brand new organization that is run by volunteers, um, has been meeting virtually as well as a little bit in person because of the work we do, super inspired by just the way that uh, this Rotary group is organized. You are so engaged. You see each other. You acknowledge one another, seeing everybody's birthdays, meeting the new members, receiving an education from Bill on Ukraine. Thank you. You should be a journalist. We should see you on CNN. Um, that was really educational. So thanks for your expertise and your knowledge. And also condolences to all of you as well, because uh, I think Admiral uh, Hayward was clearly a really wonderful person. And you're all grieving and mourning and we mourn um, with you, but he seems to and appears to have had an amazing life. So just want to acknowledge all of that um, and thank you for having us. I am going to um, share my screen at this point. 
and um, start by going back to the theme of, uh, hold on a second here, slideshow. All right, are you all seeing the green screen with the photo? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so today we're gonna talk, um, we and I are gonna talk uh, to you all about um, sort of our journey to becoming um, humanitarians. This was quite accidental and a result of um, the news that was coming out of Afghanistan last August. Um, I would just like to ask if any of you remember the fall of Saigon, April 30th, 1975. If you remember hearing about it, seeing the news footage at that time, please acknowledge you can, you know, I don't know, say something in the chat, but if you have memories of hearing about that war coming to an end in that way, um, we, I, we'd love to know um, because we're sure that, and we know that many Americans were quite moved um, by what they saw uh, on the news back then, just as we were moved to take action when we saw what was happening in August of 2021. And um, today we wanna make sure that we're talking about the work that we're doing with Vietz for Afghans, but we're really grounding this in um, the story of what is happening with Afghans today, as well as looking back and making sure that uh, we honor those who came before us and um, helped us to understand the meaning of advocacy and allyship with Afghan refugees today. I put an image of two women who are riding an elephant with their swords um, in here because I just think it's a fun way for us to uh, acknowledge that it's International Women's Day yesterday. These are the two, these are actually women who existed about 2000 years ago. They are the legendary Trung sisters of Vietnam. And um, you can do a, a quick Google search if you want, T-R-U-N-G, sisters of Vietnam. But in our culture, they're legendary because they were the first to rise up and to resist the Chinese colonizers, the people who were conquering Vietnam at the time and had ruled over the country for more than, for nearly 250 years. The Trung sisters um, led the military to fight back against the Chinese and were able to hold power for about three years um, before the Chinese came and, and took over Vietnam again. But um, we come from a motherland that uh, clearly has a history, long, long history of conflict and fighting foreign forces. But um, so many Vietnamese get their inspiration from, in Vietnamese, we call them Hai Bat Trung, or they're in English, they're the Trung sisters. There's festivals for them. There are temples and all sorts of monuments all over Vietnam because they represent independence and that human need to really want to have freedom and to be able to live the life that you want to live. Um, and so we're, uh, we're just sort of inspired. We're inspired. Many Vietnamese are inspired by them. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about a little bit of history um, for all of you. And uh, whenever there's artwork um, that is put out there um, about them, it's usually the two women riding on elephants because apparently that's, that actually happened. Who knows? But yeah. Um, uh, a little bit about us. Um, Leanne, do you want to, can your sound is up, I think, and do um, you want to tell everyone just a little bit of background before we, we talk about Bits for Afghans and the work that we're doing? Uh, yes, uh, so we thought to uh, putting in this information because, you know, sometime a label of a refugee, which I am known as now, uh, as being a refugee advocate, can also can mean a lot lot of different things. And so there's this part of me that, you know, I was born right when the Vietnam War ended. And my mom talked about bombs being dropped right when I was, uh, she was carrying me. And uh, she actually ran away with a pillow in her hand instead of me uh, because she was so scared. Um, so and I became a refugee when I was 10. I actually had seven siblings and now I only have two. So that is like the dark picture of uh, being a refugee. I also grew up with my, my, uh, without my parents. I became a refugee at 10. That I didn't expect that to be happening at all. It's similar to what you see in the Ukraine right now, you know, where many people wake up and they just, their life is completely altered and they just had no idea. Uh, so that's the tragedy of being a refugee. But then there's also the other human side. You know, I grew up with a lot of friends who actually had no idea I was a refugee. 
refugee. I was this outdoor junkie who raced in sailing. I uh, was a rock climbing champion. I used to uh, backpack a lot. And so, so there's this light side about us. It's a very complex mixture. You know, I, I have a passion for traveling. I loved uh, doing charitable work. And so anyhow, I'm very honored to be here to talk with you about our organization, especially as an, uh, uh, for International Women's Day. I never thought I would have this honor. So thank you. Tan, your turn. <laughs> yeah, uh, a little bit about me. I am the first child in my family born in the United States. My mom and dad, uh, my father served in the South Vietnamese army and was an officer and a teacher um, in Saigon uh, throughout the war years and went to re-education camp after the fall of Saigon. And that experience was enough to uh, to lead him to plot a, an escape or a way out of the country. And so while the country fell in 75, my mom and dad uh, got on a little boat with a lot of other people and fled um, and eventually reached Malaysia in 1978 and arrived in Olympia, Washington in April of 1979. And I was born a, a couple years later. Really proud to be from Olympia, Washington. Um, grew up watching uh, a lot of TV news. Como was the thing. Peter Jennings was my hero. And I'd sneak out at night. And my dad would be watching Nightline every night because it was the Cold War. And he was hoping for news of, you know, maybe when the Berlin Wall came down, that was a big deal. And I think for our community, it was always like, maybe Vietnam is next and maybe communism is going to end. And so um, it's just, it's fascinating to see the end of the Soviet Union and to remember what was going on there and to contextualize it with what is happening today with Ukraine and with Russia. It's like that war didn't actually end. It just we're experiencing it again, it's just crazy. But um, because my parents watched so much information and so much news, it led me to want to become a journalist. And I'm a former TV news reporter. I covered local politics, general assignment in Boise, Idaho, in Portland, Oregon, went back to Idaho, worked for PBS uh, there as a, a, as a producer, reporter, and a host, was a political reporter in Texas, moved back up here to Seattle about nine years ago to join the Seattle Times editorial board. So I wonder, I may have interfaced with many of you during editorial board meetings, um, perhaps, um, and uh, joined Microsoft about six years ago and was there for about five years working for the public affairs team. And in that role was traveling all over the world to tell stories about how technology is impacting societies everywhere. And uh, I did have the chance to go to Kyiv and to Ukraine um, about four years ago. At the time, mistakenly thinking, oh, wars have moved from being land wars to being, you know, cyber wars. Um, that was the thought. That was the idea at the time and was just sadly mistaken. And so it's, it, again, it's so heartbreaking to see what is happening and this refugee crisis we were trying to help Afghan refugees after the fall of, of Kabul. And so now to see this mass migration um, happening on a different continent in a different place, it's just, it's again, it's heartbreaking. Um, but uh, over the last five months, I've been at Starbucks. I'm a storyteller for the public affairs team there. Um, it's a different pace, but you know, I'm, I'm just so happy. I think being here in Washington state, being a native of this place and being associated with these, um, really these kind of hallmark companies, you know, has been a, an amazing education uh, for me. And I'm also an independent filmmaker. So I'm working on some various documentary films uh, and projects all the time. And they usually have to do or relate back to the Vietnam uh, War experience um, from different perspectives. I'm Vietnamese American, I'm a child of refugees, and so that's my perspective, but it's always a pleasure to meet people like Gerilyn. I mean, that war had such a, it played such a role in so many of our lives, and I think that um, we need to continue to process and to try to figure out what can we learn from that experience for everybody who was involved from, from all sides. I put some pictures in here. Um, I think you'll recognize some of these faces. Uh, Ralph Monroe, famous Ms. Rotarian, uh, also a wonderful ally and friend to the Vietnamese community, was really our eyes and ears and was the key aide who Governor Dan Evans sent down to uh, Camp Pendleton in 1975 um, to see what was going on because U.S. military had brought 130,000 some Vietnamese 
allies um, of the United States had brought them to the United States. And it was, it was Ralph Monroe, one individual, one person who went down there and reported back to Governor Evans saying, these people are wonderful and they need a place to go. And Washington state um, became the first state in, in the country to welcome and to invite Vietnamese refugees to resettle here, to rebuild their lives. And that is what led to my uncle coming here, resettling in Olympia. And then that led to him helping my parents resettle in Olympia as well. So I have a photo on the bottom right. There uh, are a bunch of Vietnamese refugees there holding signs. My dad is the person in the middle with the brown coat. He's got a sign there that says rescue, boat, uh, rescue people from the South China Sea, which was the route that he had taken. And at this time, we have to remember that for almost 15, 20 years after the Vietnam War ended, this refugee crisis continued. And it took continued um, advocacy by refugees, by lawmakers, by community members, by the people of this state, by Congress people, um, to really try to make a difference and to help resettle as many people as possible. And so I'm constantly inspired by looking at this photo of my dad and his peers sitting on the, they are standing on the steps of a memorial at the Capitol in Olympia. And this is, helps to serve as kind of my inspiration. And then there's a photo of my dad, who is the gentleman wearing the cap, uh, there's a photo of him shaking hands with Governor Evans, and this was from 2015, um, which was the 40th anniversary of the end of the war, um, and it was my dad's dream to be able to shake Governor Evans' hand and to be able to thank him for that generosity um, that he showed um, in, in our communities, really in our darkest hour in our time of need. Um, so anyway, a little bit of background about us. What is Viets for Afghans? Um, Essentially, I think we've, you all know that we formed during the final evacuations in August 2021. We describe ourselves as a Vietnamese-led effort to mobilize communities to act and to help Afghan refugees. That is our mission, to support as many Afghan refugees as possible through um, allyship and advocacy. And again, like when Lian sent that text out to friends, I was one of the recipients and she had known that, uh, you know, this state has a legacy, a very special legacy of helping Vietnamese refugees. And I put here uh, in 2015, when I was still a journalist at the Seattle Times, at the time I had the opportunity to pull together a short film um, and to write a uh, an editorial, an entire page dedicated to thanking Governor Evans um, and the people of Washington State for their kind gesture to Vietnamese refugees. And so it was a no-brainer that I would want to be involved um, in this project. Leanne, do you want to talk about um, more about who we are and how we run? Yeah, so we're a volunteer-run organization. Um, the co-founders were based in Seattle, but our volunteers are uh, spread all uh, across the country in Hawaii, in New York, uh, California, and so forth. Even though we're called Viets for Afghan, and, uh, and we have team members that are Vietnamese, we uh, also have Afghans who are also team member and sponsor, Caucasian and other ethnic group. So it's actually a very diverse group uh, of volunteer. And except for one grant from this uh, Starbucks Foundation, we have been funded entirely by individuals donor. We basically acted very quickly and we got uh, an organization called Vietnamese American NGO Network to be our fiscal sponsor. So pretty much right from the start, we were able to receive um, uh, uh, 501c3 uh, status. And uh, we also at one point call ourselves 75 Viet for 75 Afghan, and the 75 is dedicated to the year 1975 uh, when we went through our own evacuation. Um, so, uh, Tan, why don't you go to the next slide? Sure. Hmm. 75 was a little bit of a, it started off as a little bit of a gimmick and an homage to sort of our story, but uh, again, we're so very quickly, we learned that uh, way more than 75 people wanted to help Afghan refugees, which was super Awesome. So, um, yeah, hold on a second. I'm trying to. Okay. All right. Um, here's a, a little bit of a rundown of our projects. Um, again, we're about, we've been around for about six months now or seven months. Um, we started off as really trying to refer people. We felt that, you know, let's 
let's make sure that uh, we are helping the resettlement agencies because um, there are a set number of resettlement agencies in Washington state already. And so uh, our first call was to ask members of the Vietnamese community to provide temporary housing to the Afghan refugees who were already coming um, to the United States. And very quickly, we had about 100 um, Vietnamese people who had reached out and indicated that they wanted to help either with providing housing or paying for rent uh, or paying for hotel and motel stay. Um, so that was, at that point, it felt like, let's, let's start with this temporary housing um, effort and let's refer folks to the resettlement agencies for that help. And then eventually we started to quickly learn about other ways that we could assist as well. Uh, Wien, do you wanna talk about humanitarian parole and these other issues? Yeah, since we only have four minutes left, I'm just gonna uh, plow through this really quickly. The humanitarian parole assistance program is really a way for us to help those that are stuck behind. Everyone in our um, founding team were, at, were children of refugee or um, refugee that left after 1975. I actually left in 1985. So we believe that the people who are stuck behind will be paying the biggest toll uh, to the evacuation. So that program is um, a way for us to legally sponsor the ones that are um, still left there and bring them over to the United States. The sponsor circle program is probably the one that we get the most press for. And this is the one that we, where we sponsor Afghan uh, families. Uh, this program is essentially uh, a way for us to, um, uh, us as in private citizen to step up and sponsor family without having uh, to go through reset of, uh, resettlement agency. And this is actually a very, very innovative program. In 40 years that uh, uh, refugee resettlement work has been in existence, uh, there is no way that you can actually sponsor a family without going through the resettlement agency. So this pilot program is a way to test out a new method and possibly a create a new law that will allow private citizen like us or, you know, Rotarian to step up and say, I want to sponsor a family, a uh, Ukrainian family that are, let's say, residing in Poland. And so, um, so this uh, program was started because the resettlement agency was so overwhelmed and uh, they uh, needed private citizen help to step up and uh, help as many people as possible. So we thought that this was a great opportunity for us, not only to help Afghan family, but also to possibly change the law um, and um, uh, create new path for private citizen to do something. Because the sad reality with refugee resettlement is that it's very dependent on which president you have. The entire refugee resettlement quota is set by the president. It can be advocated uh, for um, in terms of the number of um, in a quota by Congress, by private citizen, but the quota itself is uh, single-handedly set by the president. So by having a private sponsorship option, this will uh, hopefully allow us to bypass um, that uh, quota in the future. So uh, we we work quite cleverly. One of my colleagues is actually on the call right now too. She Amina Le, uh, she leads this program for us, and uh, we did a couple of things that uh, really made a huge difference in ab ability for us to move very quickly. One, uh, we realized that not everybody have the money to become sponsor. So what we did was that we raised the money for the people who don't have the money. The other part is that we realize that not everyone has enough friends or people in their circle to form a circle of five because that's the requirement by the government that you have to have a circle of five uh, to form a private sponsorship group. So what we did was that we also match people together and um, for a common cause and, and form circle as quickly as possible. And uh, the third thing that we did, uh, we thought was also very clever is that we knew that we just don't have uh, the language skill to uh, speak to the Afghan family. So in each of our circle, there is uh, at least one Afghan member to help us uh, with the cultural competency and also language skill. So for Afghan became the first group 
a private citizen in uh, the United States and definitely the first one in Washington state to sponsor a uh, Afghan family. And as of uh, today, we have a sponsor circle, uh, over 40 plus volunteer um, and uh, 40, 400 something plus donor that goes to support 59 uh, Afghan refugees in the Seattle area. Um, and I, I think it's really important to note as well that uh, there is, there's a new report that's just come out. The initial wave of Afghan refugees, the United States was able to evacuate uh, like between 120 and 130,000 um, US allies, Afghan um, allies of the United States government and military. And um, they were taken to you know, bases in the United States as well as in other countries. And uh, there's a new report that indicates that 78,000 US allies were left behind and are now living, many of them in hiding um, with the Taliban in power. And so this crisis is so not over. And while we're trying to do our part, whatever we can to help those refugees who were lucky enough to be evacuated and are here in the United States already. There's also a need for advocacy to help those who are left behind. Um, and this is something where we take, we get so much inspiration um, from so many of those who came before us. And like, you know, looking at in 1975, the fact that it was American citizens, maybe some of you who are here with us today, perhaps your families recall your churches sponsoring um, Vietnamese families at the time, um, taking us into your homes and helping us to sign up for ESL, sign up for um, benefits, you know, and, and helping us to find those first jobs. Like that's the legacy that we're dealing with. And so we're not trying to do something brand new here. We're actually trying to learn from um, the legacy, you know, that that so many who came before us have have left for us. And so um, I we created this slide just to, I think, to pay homage to like our moms and um, we're running out of time. And so, you know, I put like a picture of Wien's mom and her siblings. I think that really helps to drive her. For me, my mother coming to Olympia and not, not having any she didn't know English, didn't know anything, but it was the community coming together and helping her to get her first job with the state and what that did, what that opportunity was able to do for me and for my sisters is incredible. Um, you know, it takes so much sustained effort over time as well. I put a picture of um, a woman named Kuk Minh Tha. She is a Vietnamese um, activist. She worked for 11 plus years after the war to try to help um, help to develop an orderly departure program for those Vietnamese who had been left behind in Vietnam um, after the Vietnam War ended. She worked with a bipartisan group of lawmakers, Senator John Kerry, Senator John McCain, and they helped to develop what became known as the orderly departure program and what paved and opened the doors for um, US allies who had been left behind to come and resettle in the United States. And so, um, Rian and I were recently featured in this Asian Premier Magazine's Most Influential Asian Americans, which is awesome. But again, it's like it, it didn't just happen. It's a result of honoring those who came before us and sort of paved the path for us to do this. Um, so, yeah, if you'd like to learn more about Vietz for Afghans, uh, we have a website, vietsforafghans.org. We have an email as well. We're looking, always looking for help and support. We're also on social media and our general, um, you can find us if you look for Vietz for Afghans. And so I put it on the screen there. These are photos of our amazing volunteers um, having direct, uh, helping out families, um, spending quality time with them and, um, it's just, it's been a lot of fun. So sorry for taking up so much time. I, I, maybe I should hand it back to someone with Rotary. And if anyone that, has questions, let us know. That will be me. Unfortunately, we've literally run out of time, but we really appreciate you bringing this conversation. It is so not what I thought this was conversation was going to be. So I found it to be very, very fascinating. So thank you both for coming and bringing this today. And Gerald, and thank you for putting this on our radar. We really appreciate it.